who uh, generously uh, supported um, this activity, uh, uh, graciously have supported this activity and allowed us to bring um, internationally renowned speakers here to Phoenix Children's. Um, uh, as many of you do know, uh, Dr. Shelton was a pediatric gastroenterologist and uh, was here at PCH for many years. Uh, some of my partners uh, remember him um, uh, uh, and, and talk about how great of a clinician he was, and his family was really excited about setting up this um, educational uh, Grand Rounds um, speakership. So today, I have the absolute pleasure uh, of introducing Dr. Benjamin Gold. Um, Dr. Gold uh, is a, 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 you know, you, you have to be careful when you say that people are extremely experienced because it makes them just sound old. Um, but Dr. Gold is probably the youngest old person I know. Um, his energy is unmatched. Um, his passion for pediatric gastroenterology is unmatched. His dedication to our field in pediatric gastroenterology is unmatched. He is currently the past president currently serving his two-year term as the media past president um, uh, of NASPIGIN, which is our North American Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition. Um, uh, he is, that's his current extra time, but his, his career has been built uh, on incredible clinical care. He spent many years at Emory University, uh, served as their division chief, uh, and then has been in um, uh, private practice now in the Atlanta area again for uh, almost two decades, I believe. Um, so close, 15 years, 14 years. So um, uh, that was after, I think, almost two decades at, at Emory. So uh, that's right. <laughs> so exactly. Uh, so he um, uh, built uh, much of his early career uh, on um, uh, esophageal disease, uh, upper GI disease, um, but really has done uh, an incredible amount of work um, in, in all fields of uh, pediatric GI. Um, I got most of my uh, initial um, exposure with him through our Improved Care Now network and inflammatory bowel disease. So he is really, um, uh, as they actually describe him, a, a quadruple threat, research, teaching, excellent clinical care, um, and then actually the ability to manage and develop healthcare systems, run systems like NASPIGIN um, has been really, really incredible. So uh, today he's going to speak to us at Grand Rounds on understanding inflammation in the pediatric esophagus, um, gastroesophageal reflux disease, or eosinophilic esophagitis, or both. Is dysphagia a first clue? Dr. Gold, thank you so much. It, it's OG, and you can put whatever the G, the original gold. Um, thank you so much for having me here. I wish I actually could have stayed actually longer, just because there's a number of uh, my dear friends who I've known for years, including mentees, former mentees, um, uh, my mentor, um, uh, who uh, has uh, helped me through. Um, navigating, uh, uh, being part of the administrative structure of NASP again. Uh, my professional development committee chairmanship was a six-year process that Mitch actually kind of guided me through. And, and I just, I wish I could spend some more time. And um, I have another opportunity, at least later today, to talk to a few of you guys from the GI um, world. What I'm going to try to do for you today is to tell the story. Um, in part because, yes, I'm a clinician. I don't have to worry about what I have to do every morning when I get up. I see patients. But I also am interested in the questions that get raised by seeing those patients and how they can be answered either by the literature or, if there isn't any literature, what studies need to be done. Um, I still have a cross appointment at the CDC, so I also like to think about populations and health prevention. Um, my sort of latter part of my career was in quality improvement, and that's really where Ashish and I um, uh, kind of uh, bonded was through the Improved Care Now Network. The story today really is a little bit of a parallel of what my career is like. I started um, thinking when I went up to Toronto in, uh, um, to do my fellowship training, um, no, I'm not Canadian. My daughter was born up there. We tried to leave her at the border, but they made us bring her back. Um, so now she's a dual citizen and she's living in London. 
Um, but it was sort of, you know, I had choices all over and figured, why not? Um, so my wife and I moved up um, uh, with a three month old um, to sick kids and got thrown in the lab, had never held a pipette before, did not know what a tissue culture flask was. And because at that time, the whole premise was, you're going to be a clinician scientist. That's the way the world works. Seeing patients, you're kind of less than. Um, I mean, one of my former mentors get hives when they get on the hospital service um, and go into anaphylaxis. So um, we had to really help coach him through, you know, diaphragmatic breathing and other things that we now know in functional GI disease. Anyway, but started with the H. pylori in the stomach and then kind of moved proximally, not distally. Um, we can talk about that at a later point in time, or I know the jokes are already thinking about it in your head. Um, and so got involved in esophageal disease and reflux. And my interest has always been in inflammation in the GI tract. And in particular, how the fact that the inflammation or severity thereof doesn't always correlate with the symptoms that you see that the child reports. And I don't care what disease paradigm, whether it's IBD, whether it's peptic ulcer disease or EOE or um, uh, reflux. And so how these two intersect um, is an important issue. And part of, um, I started the Aerodigestive Pro um, Center at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta actually 2005. And so I have also a interest in what happens here and love being an instigator with my ENT colleagues, which like to blame everything in the head and neck on reflux. Um, and now they're starting to think about EOE because it's another thing they can blame because they can't figure it out. The pulmonologists um, try to blame everything on reflux there, but a little bit harder to come around. Um, but the bottom line is at least working with them together in the same setting and then doing the triple scopes allows one to see kind of how everything intersects. And so that's part of the story that I'm going to tell for you today. Okay, it's not advancing. How about enter? Let's click on that. Switch. Let's click on this. There you go. Okay. okay. Now this should work. Oh, okay. So you added in. All right. So required to give um, my disclosures. Um, gonna hide this. Got it. Um, however, so not working. There we go. None of the relationships I have have anything to do with the content of this presentation. Um, the objectives today are to give you some definitions to work with in terms of understanding what I'm going to talk about. So defining dysphagia and feeding problems, which is really the primary referral that we get to the Aerodigestive Center, and whether symptoms are a clue for underlying disease. As an epidemiologist, I want to talk about the two entities, EOE and reflux disease, and what does the epidemiology say and how do they present. And then I'll talk about what I think is the biologic plausibility of these two either being linked or true, true, and unrelated. Um, and we'll talk about whether it's cause and effect, and then I'll talk to you about um, diagnostic processes, and then finally um, treatment approaches and where we need to head. So if you go back over the last 15 years, and one of the things, and I tell this to my um, trainees and fellows and, and junior faculty when I'm critiquing their talks, that if you have a reference that's over 10 to 15 years old, don't use it. And if you do, it better be a landmark paper. Um, um, and I want to know, just because of the internet and the speed thereof, I mean, I was up till two last night making sure there was no more, you know, breaking articles on any of the diseases I was going to talk about today that I could add into the talk. And then I would have been texting John and saying, I, I need to unload up another um, presentation. So the three working, and this really comes more from the adult world. And it's kind of interesting because I think we're still teaching our adult colleagues that when you stick a scope in an orifice, you need to biopsy because there's important information you can get. They typically don't do that. Um, whereas in PEDS GI, if we stick a scope in an orifice, we will biopsy. And there's actually lots of data that supports that. So is it reflux of food from the stomach that increases the exposure to proteins that um, we might react to um, in the esophageal epithelium? Or 
Is it reflux-induced dilatation, the first step in the inflammatory process with reflux and dilatation of intercellular spaces in the epithelium that then allows the inflammatory immune system to move in and capture these proteins, these antigens um, into the mucosa with the right genetic background and induced disease? Or is it a common inflammatory pathway? We'll come back to this at the end. So first, dysphagia, as I said, the most common um, referral aspect to our aerodigestive program and, and in studies that have been done by the aerodigestive SIG special interest group of NASPGAN, it's probably the, the, the primary or most common reason for referral to most aerodigestive programs. And dysphagia is not, kids don't say, I have dysphagia. Adults will tell you that things stick but you'll get it and you have to ask the right questions to the parents to elicit whether or not there's issues with feeding. But it occurs in 25 to 40% of infants and children with absolutely normal development. A, I think, wonderful research project that I is begging to be done is why the natural history of these 12 to 18 month old that come in that are completely neurologically normal, but fail their swallow studies and aspirate everything, thins um, uh, and thickened liquids. And then what happens to them? And why do some need NG tubes for a long period of time and some eventually outgrow it? 33 to 80% of infants and children with developmental delays and up to 42% of those in the premature population. And when you think about um, sort of national databases, this is one published in the Journal of Pediatrics about um, uh, two years ago, um, highlights that there's a prevalence now, okay, epidemiology 101, the prevalence of a condition is the frequency of that condition at one time. So if I asked all of you to raise your hands as to who many ha has food allergies um, and those who raised their hand, and then I came back a year from now, same group, and I ask you to raise your hands, that's incidence. So it's following a population over time and looking at that condition. Prevalence is the frequency of that condition at any one time. It's much harder to do incidence studies. But prevalence has been increasing in all populations in these two, and they used a, um, a database um, looking at, at health records. And this is a paper published just last year looking at the prevalence of oral pharyngeal dysphagia um, in different populations. And again, showed the same thing, that um, this is a condition that seems to be going up and really for reasons that aren't clearly um, articulated. So esophageal dysphagia, which is really what I'm gonna focus on, arises from the esophagus, lower esophageal sphincter, the cardia of the stomach, and is due to mechanical or motility related um, problems. And I know you all have a motility program um, that is up and running. Um, and I think it's a very important component. So Jose Garza, who runs our neurogastro motility program, also is my sort of partner in crime at, with our aerodigestive center. Um, we do endoflips, we do uh, um, high res manometry with impedance, and we use those in some of these kids that we're still trying to figure things out. Dysphagia to both solids and liquids is a motility problem. Dysphagia that occurs initially to solids but progresses to involve liquids is most likely a mechanical problem. When you think about dysphagia at the pharyngeal area, so the third phase of feeding and swallowing, first phase, you take it in, second phase, mastication, and then transfer to the back, third phase, you initiate the swallow. It's that primary dysph dysphagia that you see issues with. That starts with thins, and, um, and they do better with um, thicker liquids because they can handle um, those better. Mediastinal diseases, so the differential is, long, is um, uh, infections, cardiovascular, diseases affecting the smooth muscle and its intervention, other motility disorders. So they get their uh, anti-reflux surgery for their um, severe reflux and uh, they can get esophageal dysphagia as well. Um, intraluminal foreign bodies, um, acute dysphagia, erosive esophagitis, severe non-erosive disease, kids with bad reflux can develop or present with feeding issues. And that's their only primary symptom. Um, peptic strictures, tumors, um, and then uh, the bottom part, eosinophilic esophagitis. And if you look at the pathophysiology of dysphagia and EOE, and this is a very nice review published in uh, last year in Digestive Diseases and Sciences, that while fibrosynodic processes appear to be critical in development of uh, dysphagia and EOE, 
We still don't know how to predict who's going to get this um, uh, fibrosis um, and why some of these people don't have the phenotype, um, but also has some matter sensory dysfunction, the disorder of gut brain interaction, and dysmotility all contribute to the dysphagia. Now, I know this is a great slide for first thing in the morning, but the number one cause of children showing up in the ER between 11 to 17 years of age, Annals of Emergency Medicine, last year was EOE. And now the ED guys love to say, oh, if food's stuck, it's got to be EOE, and then we get called. Now, unfortunately, if we don't get called and the surgeon gets called because they're at an outlying hospital, they oftentimes get the meat infection out and nobody gets biopsies, and so these kids get hacked need to get scoped again. So what about EOE? It's history, it's epidemiology, and the whole relationship to food allergy. First described by Landris in 1978. So this is still relatively young or new in terms of the grand scheme of things disease. My uh, dear friend, Dr. Harlan Winter, um, threw us all off the, 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 the case in 1982 when he had this landmark paper that described eosinophils and the biopsies of children who had reflux disease. And then all of a sudden, that became the pathognomonic finding when you biopsied a child that had reflux and you saw EOs, but it's good. Um, and well, were we missing anybody that had EOE? And during the next 10 years, at least through the world's literature, finding any EOs was believed to confirm GERD. And it wasn't until the mid 1990s that things started to change. And at that time, EOE was felt to be a disease that didn't affect adults and primarily affected children and adolescents um, uh, and was rare. First descriptive series of EOE in adults, 1993 by Atwood, 12 adults with dysphagia and 20 EOs, and then a number of case reports, and you can see how um, the, we struggled with how to define it. Strom and Kelly uh, broadened the definition for this histopathologic condition in both adults and children, and we started to hone in on the cutoff in terms of what the number of EOs in the biopsies were needed to um, cause the disease. But there were some interesting features in the literature at that time because they described these patients as not responding to acid suppression, PPIs, HG blockers, high dose, um, but they responded to anti-allergy therapy and to dietary restrictions. And then the landslide of papers occurred and the first um, NAS began single topic actually was um, at that time the on EOE and it was a multi-center uh, or multidisciplinary conference um, that um, came up with this uh, landmark paper. So there you go, landmark paper over 10 years ago. Um, Glenn Feruda from uh, Denver, Chris Leocoris from um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And that was the first that really defined this as an entity and started to shape where research um, needed to go. This was the FIGERS meeting, the first gastrointestinal eosinophil research. Now it's TIGERS. Um, and then there's Seeger, which is based at Cincinnati with the uh, EOE mafio, mafiosa, Mark Rothenberg. He's a good guy, though. Um, a little bit of uh, bringing it closer to home. Um, in our practice, we are now 18 um, in our group. We see about 39,000 patients per year. Um, in 2012, 590 patients with EOE. In 2022, um, 1477. If you control for the number of endoscopies, that's real increase in the prevalence of this disease. So it's going up. And if you look worldwide, it's going up um, uh, in lots of different populations. And where I think, again, another area, just throwing it out there for research, is looking at um, you know, using diversity, equity, and inclusion. We don't really talk about different populations and how they get affected. We're starting to do that now in the IBD world, but we haven't done that yet in the OE. Who gets infected, uh, affected? Why? How does the disease behave um, over time? And then uh, what I think is because this is, again, using the improved care now sort of mantra, which is all stakeholders at the table. Um, they're doing this, at least in Europe and EOE, and we need to do it here in the U.S. And there's a, a working group that's starting um, uh, to do that, which is EOE Connect. And it's a registry of clinicians parents, patients, um, and, and really, and centers that are trying to get a handle on this condition and phenotype the disease and find out who's more at risk. 
Now, why is this important if you give the context of other entities? So allergies in uh, the US have gone up dramatically over the past 20 years. And if you look at NHANES data, it's interesting because if you look at the um, box on the, uh, the right, um, it's the lower so Southern states in the one to five year olds where allergies are dramatically increasing. And why is that interesting? Well, I, it's sort of, I'm not a, um, a, a sociological historian, but if you think about it, having lived now in Georgia for um, well over 20 years, this represents the industrialization of the South. It's gone from a rural area where you play in the dirt and um, you get lots of exposure, excuse me, I talk with my hands. And, um, and so you develop a more robust immune system. I mean, there's a reason why a, a child who is born into the house with a dog or a cat does not develop or less likely to develop dog or cat dander allergies by the time they hit age 10. One of the best ads, which I have a little video, which I'm not gonna to show today because we were having too many problems uploading this um, uh, is, and I can't even remember the product that it's for, but there's this um, uh, dad feeding his toddler. There's a little like golden doodle sitting by a sliding glass door window. Um, the kids, like a typical toddler has stuff everywhere, face, the hair, um, all around them. Um, and then the dad hears the door open, uh oh, leaves to go get something to clean the kid off, comes running back before mom comes in, because that was mom at the front door. The kid is spotless. It doodles back by the sliding glass door window, licking his lips. Um, so there's a little sharing of the microbiome that was going on. And that's probably one of the reasons why you see the, uh, the robustness when you're born into the house with a dog or a cat um, with a child. And it's interesting because if you look worldwide and having a daughter who lives in London, she sort of, um, and being a journalist, she works for ESPN, she sends me stuff and she's like, hey, dad, it's different here than it is in the US. And actually the leading cause of food anaphylaxis in the UK is cow's milk, not peanuts, not tree nuts. Um, and so actually to get a little audience participation. So what are the nine, and this is recent, um, from FDA AAP, the nine most common IgE, there's two pathways that we react to food proteins, non IgE and IgE. What are the, and the IgE has all the testing, non IgE, we just sort of throw our hands up and hopefully get a good history, or you do the gold standard, no pun intended, which is a food challenge in the office and pray. Um, but what are the, what, what are the nine most common? Anybody? Shellfish, okay, that's one of them. Huh? Tree nuts, eggs, dairy, soy, wheat. Yeah, good job. So there you go. So milk, eggs, peanuts, tree nuts, fish, shellfish, um, sesame, soy, and wheat. And what's interesting is you know, we, we totally forget about the soy-based formulas. And yet, if you look at non-IgE mediated allergy, over 50% of children who have dairy protein allergy, either the casein or whey, or both, will re react to soy. But not IgE mediated allergy, actually, you can still, less than 20% will have cross-reactivity to soy. <laughs> and a very recent um, uh, uh, survey, and study published by um, the Quad AI that really shows that IgE mediated allergies on the rise. The prevalence varies depending upon what region you're in. Um, I put the star there because we see this all the time in the office. Um, more people believe that they are, are allergic to foods than they actually are allergic to foods. And it really is very hard, hard, difficult to get them to unwrap their heads around the fact that they think that that child is reacting. And relatively small percentage have positive skin prick tests, which also are based on IgE mated allergies. All right, so with that kind of background, pathogenesis of EOE, we used to think the esophagus was just the solid tube that connected the mouth and the stomach. We now know that it actually is this very rich immune organ that does a whole lot of things, um, has its own microbiome, 
I had one of the neatest meetings I got to go to in the last um, few years was uh, a meeting entitled the Esophagium. It was really cool because it was in Monte Carlo too. Um, and it was given by, and I, I was one of the few pediatric folks. It's an adult meeting called OESO. Um, it's because in Europe, they spell esophagus with an O, don't ask me why. Um, uh, and so it's GORD, not GERD. Um, but in terms of Right. Um, but in terms of this meeting, and they always had it like every couple of years, um, and all the esophageal like gods would come to this meeting, um, uh, neurogastro folks, and this meeting was in Monte Carlo, but the whole title of the meeting or the focus was on the microbiome in the esophagus and how that plays an important role. So a whole lot of different things that go on in the esophagus that um, help with how our immune system first starts processing um, the things that we eat and breathe. Um, and you can see from this um, review published uh, about um, uh, eight years ago um, uh, that there's a whole host of different things that have been described. Um, and when you think about the pathogenesis, we now know that there is a genetic component, but not in everybody. Um, there's a 96 um, uh, gene PCR assay that Cincinnati with some begging and some cajoling will do for you in a clinical setting. But you can see clearly on the figure on the right where um, the uh, panel on the left is normal, um, GERD is in the middle, and then EOE is um, on the right. It clearly separates out um, children and adolescents that have reflux-related disease as compared to um, uh, eosinophilic esophagitis. And then first paper that really did a careful job of describing the microbiota within the esophagus, um, this particular paper that showed that the, the microbiome within patients with EOE is very distinct and unique from those that um, didn't have EOE. Less diversity, um, uh, um, more uniform type of microbes um, that are involved in the pathogenesis. And then this lovely review, which got published a couple of years ago that looked at lower and showed lower microbial rich, richness um, identify some specific taxa of organisms that you can find in the esophageal mucosa. And, um, and then this paper that just got published, so hot off the press this month, um, that looked at um, this concept of dysbiosis as a predominant trait in um, patients with EOE. So there's a genetic issue, there's an immune dysfunction or dysregulation, and then there's a dysbiosis in the microbiome that results in the disease. And again, this elegant review, um, uh, you'll see who the lead author is, Glenn Feruda, published in the New England Journal, I think still best encapsulates this multi-pathway uh, approach in which people develop EOE. Where we haven't gone is defining phenotypes. So who is going to respond just to dietary therapy alone? Which select group of patients actually respond to desensitization to environmental allergies, environmental allergens, food restriction medication aside, and their EOE resolves? Um, who responds just to PPIs and then who really needs to go to the new agents? And I've mentioned at the very end, um, biologics. So what about precedent esophageal injury, micro or macroscopic due to reflux as the portal of entry for things that you eat or you breathe that reduce that results in EOE? Well, a nice model, if you will, is esophageal atresia. Um, it's a condition, uh, or if you live in Europe, oesophageal atresia. Um, uh, and it's a characterized by congenital obstruction of the esophagus, interruption of the continuity of the esophageal wall, um, comprises a number of congenital defects. It's seen in about one in every 25 to 3,500 live births, often has other midline defects, factorial association um, being them. And there's now a transatlantic guidelines, um, and we're actually working on the, um, the, the update of this. Um, and here's the algorithm. Um, and there's a reason why in these patients, because they're highly at risk for esophageal dysmotility, um, the surgeons sort of think that once they connect the plumbing, that everything's working right. And for those of you in neurogastromotility, realize that it doesn't necessarily mean the nerves are going to work well, and even more that the muscles that the nerves are supposed to fire are going to work well. Um, and these kids are very high at risk 
um, for um, severe sequelae of uh, prolonged reflux. Um, and then there's a, so this is, gives you a nice uh, um, algorithm of how we approach these children. And if you look at the literature over the last sort of five to 10 years, there's been increasing number of publications that have identified EOE in this population. Um, this is one of the larger ones. Usha Krishnan is um, a lovely, um, really brilliant um, pediatric gastroenterologist in City Children's and is actually the leader of a, of a national international network uh, of, a, of those of us interested in this entity. Um, and she described it in, in a number of patients, 110 in this particular um, paper um, uh, that she looked at and a large percent that had EOE. And then a paper published in JPEG's GNN about four years ago, again, same thing that showed that a higher prevalence of EOE in patients with esophageal atresia. So it's important to think about these um, patients. And I like to think about you know, everything that it's a team sport. I don't care what patient I deal with. It's, it, and even if it's just you and the parents and the child, it's a team sport. And for these conditions, you know, whether or not you're going to see the allergy once and then never go back, but having an allergist involved, dietitian, sometimes having speech language pathology, if they've got feeding related issues, um, GI, uh, um, uh, immunology sometimes. And these help us in defining the condition, but really not the whether or not GERD and EOE are related. So just a few microscopy uh, slides, normal esophageal histology. Uh, the top part, um, if you can see, is the lumen of the esophagus, basal layer, um, really quiet. There's not a whole lot of inflammatory cells. Reflux, you'll see a lengthening of that basal layer. Um, uh, you'll start to see um, a little bit, you'll see there's even EOs in this particular slide. And then um, uh, those that have EOE, uh, a, a really huge number of eosinophils, you'll see micro abscesses. Those are those white little dots that we see in the line in the esophagus um, that are due to uh, eosinophilic abscesses. So the first international meeting defined EOE as a clinical pathologic disease. And the, it was the, that reflux, the premise at this meeting back in 2006, 2007, was that reflux was the only thing that responded to PPI therapy. They updated those consensus recommendations in 2011. And for those of us who sort of were looking at the esophagus before we knew about EOE, erosive esophagitis was abbreviated EE, and we really needed to change the nomenclature. And it's still confused sometimes, but changed EOE, EE to EOE to differentiate it from erosive esophagitis. It's been added as a chronic immune mediated condition, stronger emphasis on excluding other causes. And they introduced this concept of PPI responsive eosinophil uh, eosinophilic esophagitis. So kids that you would put on a PPI, no medication, no, so they wouldn't get their corticosteroids, no dietary restrictions or allergy in de a desensitization and the disease would go away. And so the question sort of started to arise, is PPI uh, um, responsive EOE a subtype? Similar presenting symptoms, similar endoscopic and histologic findings, similar inflammatory uh, chemokine and tissue biomarkers. And they're really, and when you look at gene expression in these patients, it's very difficult to distinguish. So EOE and PPIRE are virtually indistinguishable from one another at a clinical, molecular, um, and a genetic level. And they're very different from reflux disease. So when we, we look at the time of endoscopy, we actually now have validated scoring systems that we use so we can grade the severity. And these tools can be used in clinical trials because they're robust enough to actually show an incremental change when you're doing the right thing with respect to therapy. And the five sort of markers that we use, um, and there's a zero to two uh, grading scale, we have it as part of and most endoscopy reporting generators. So we use Provations, which is incorporated into Epic, and it's right there, and you can point and click and you can do the um, EREF score. Um, uh, and then uh, there's a, a nice paper published by Evan Dellen, who's at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and uh, this is it's an adult-based paper, but actually shows how this score is robust and responds to therapy. 
Um, and it's important, um, and we say this all the time, even though my colleagues don't always follow the rules, that biopsies from proximal, mid, and distal esophagus are important, and this paper um, published in 2019 shows that. So finally, the most recent update conference called the AGREE conference, and they met at DDW in 2017, and finally about two and a half years later, came up with a paper, um, uh, and they said that no longer a PPI trial is required before diagnosing EOE, but to consider PPIs as sole base of the therapy. And this was the paper um, published um, in 2018. Um, and then more recently, this past year, um, the FDA held, held a multidisciplinary panel. Um, the, the guy right there is Mark Rothenberg, and that's his son, um, who's a budding gastroenterologist. Um, uh, uh, the, the folks at Cincinnati are convinced that he's not going to go into allergy. He's going to go into GI because they say it's a, it's much better. And he's a he's a a gamer already, and so allergists don't have you know cool toys that they can play with like we do. And the nice thing about this, and there's a, there were at least a half a dozen papers that came out of this um, conference, is they really looked at eosinophils in the entire gastrointestinal tract, what they mean, how you diagnose them, how you treat them and, and manage them. So um, some important um, reading if you want to learn more about this. Um, this paper, I think, is key to what I said in the very beginning that one of the things we still don't quite understand is, and I sort of try to explain it to parents, you know, when we were growing up and you're out on the playground, everybody knew who the wimps were. You know, those are the ones that stub their toe and it's like their leg had fallen off. And we all know the people who, you know, who break a leg and they're still out there trying to play. Total stoic to musculoskeletal pain. Well, it's the same thing, I don't know if you would agree, Dr. McGee, but with the GI tract. There are GI wimps, and there are GI stoics. So, you know, there are people who, if you fart wrong, they're like, you know, oh, oh it's just terrible. And, or if they, if they burp wrong. Um, me, you know, I have a fart app on my iPhone, so I start playing the different farts to see which one that they typically have. But this paper uh, published this year actually shows that there's no difference in the degree of eosinophilic inflammation in the GI, in the esophagus and symptom scores. So again, it begs the question that symptoms, and which is one of the reasons, unfortunately, having been one of the lead investigators in the budesonide, the liquid budesonide trial, it did not get FDA approval. And why? Because the primary outcome was dysphagia. And it, it met every other parameter, which again, we can go into the politics behind that. But the bottom line is that, again, symptom scores are, you can't just rely on that. And then why are PPIs, and this is for those that are PPI haters, they're not just acid blockade drugs. Um, they do a whole lot of other things. There's actually a, um, a cytoprotective role. They block STAT6, which mediates expression of eataxin 3. So they actually help in the, the proteins that call in eosinophils into the esophagus. Um, and they also play a role in blocking eosinophil recruitment, as well as a down-regulating inflammation. So they're not just acid blockers, if you will, and there's actually data in both adults and um, pediatrics. So the adult uh, studies are on the left, pediatric studies are on the right. And you'll see in adult studies, oh, up to 50% will respond just to a PPI alone. In pediatric studies, between 25 to 40% respond to a PPI alone. And what about reflux disease and is there a link? So how do we differentiate the happy spitters, the babies that you could aim and I could hit Mitch um, from here um, with their spray, but otherwise they've got, you know, chunks and rolls in their thighs. Um, they look like the Buddha bear um, and, and they're happy and they don't mind it when you spray everything. Now, the parents are totally stressed because the dry cleaning bill has gone up. They've had to reupholster the furniture. Um, the car smells like eau de regurgitant from Macy's um, because of the spit up that's constant. Um, it depends upon the formula that they use based on the smell. Um, but we don't have a single diagnostic test or group of tests that says it's GERD or it's not GERD. And who's going to benefit from therapy? I can tell you there's well over 20 clinical trials with PPIs, randomized placebo control, different time lengths, different degree of dosing of PPIs in under one year of age, 
and there's no difference in placebo. Well, I have some explanation for that in a time. At, at the end, we can talk about that, but we still don't know really who's going to benefit from therapy. And it's also important that you identify those patients that really are going to need to be monitored long term to have better outcomes. And again, as an epidemiologist and really steal shamelessly, share seamlessly, like ICN says all the time, borrow some of the literature in IBD where we now can classify disease phenotype and target therapy based on the disease phenotype that they have. We need to do that with reflux. We need to do that with EOE. Sounding like a preacher now. Um, gastroesophageal reflux is normal in everybody. If I stuck a pH probe uh, and pedis catheter down, all of you guys, for, you would be refluxing 4% of the time if you have normal, unlike I, I have heard. Um, uh, so mine is a little more than 4% of the 24 hour day, but it's a normal physiologic process that depressurizes the stomach. And the action is right here um, at the lower esophageal sphincter. Reflux disease is a motility disorder. The inflammation is a result of persistent reflux that then causes injury or increased distension and stretch and discomfort because of it. Um, and if you look at the reasons for this, there's a reason why infants have more reflux episodes than do older children and adults. Um, and it's because of the anatomy, because they get fed every three to four hours and they have smaller, less compliant stomachs. But the pathophysiology in a 37 week newborn, a five-year-old, a 15-year-old, or an older guy like me, age unmentioned, is transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxations and inhibition of the esophageal body peristalsis. So when reflux comes up, the esophageal body fails to squeeze and push it back down before you're even aware of it, and that results in the disease. And there's lots of data that show this is the same entity. So we still don't have a good drug that got taken off the market um, some 23 years ago that can help with the motility related component. So we tried to come up with this multinational consensus panel. This paper published in 2009. Um, it, was a, it was a seminal paper, so that's why I included it. Um, I was one of the authors there um, and my mentor too. And now the more recent um, uh, guidelines published about four years ago, Rachel Rosen from Boston was the lead author, but it defines reflux, reflux disease, refractory GERD, which are the ones you really need to worry about and what are optimal therapy. And do we need something like a pediatric Crohn's disease activity index or pediatric ulcerative colitis activity index for GERD or EOE? When you look at inflammation in the esophagus, so those, the, the pink is normal, the red streaks is not normal, though that's erosive esophagitis. And in the absence of histology, whether you biopsy or not, that doesn't rule out GERD. The paradigm of acid-related injury, again, is the same in children and in adults. And so the transatlantic guidelines recommended doing an endoscopy and biopsies to look at the complications, not to diagnose the condition if you suspect there's underlying disease. Um, and now the adults are starting to do the same thing. Nimish McKeel, who's in Wisconsin, um, uh, is one of those esophageal gods, if you will, has done a lot of work, both in the motility world as well as in, um, in reflux. Um, and they're recommending now to take biopsies in the esophagus and, and delineate between reflux, inflammation, and not. And what, what I'd like to propose to you for reflux now is we've now actually got some good working um, definitions. And Rachel and, and her colleagues and, and the neurogastro motility world really has done this work. Um, and this was this paper published in JPEDS um, a couple of years ago. Microscopic esophagitis doesn't predict reflux phenotype and PPI responsiveness also doesn't help define the phenotype. Similar story to EOE. And so you have it sort of in thirds, about 20%, 27%, a little over a quarter will have excessive reflux and symptoms that are associated with the reflux. And those are your nerds and erosive reflux disease and they respond to PPIs. A little over a quarter will have physiologic reflux, not abnormal, 
have symptoms that are uh, usually associated with the reflux episodes. And those are actually characterized as hypersensitive esophagus. They respond to PPIs, but also to modulators of perception. And then you have what I think are the GI esophageal wimps, the physiologic reflux that have functional heartburn and you need cognitive and behavioral therapy, hypnotherapy, and other things other than a PPI. So who's at risk for long-term uh, problems with reflux? The problem is, since it's a, um, a diagnosis that's made basically by exclusion, there aren't good population-based epidemiology studies. This is a UK study that controlled databases that looked at people who had labeled somebody as having GERD, and they looked at uh, decreasing incidence um, over the first year or so of life, and then a uh, rise somewhere around preteens and, and early adolescence. Um, and when you look at um, uh, worldwide, it's clear that the prevalence and incidence, so frequency at one time and incidence, so the frequency over time, have not increased at the same rate as EOE. This study, which you couldn't do it in any other than the Scandinavian countries, I think is one of the best papers that um, has looked at this. So this was... Uh, over 3,000 babies um, born in Sweden between 1925 to 1949, where I can confidently say there weren't any PPIs and there weren't any H2 blockers. And so these were untreated reflux let, uh, left alone. And what they showed, which was actually um, uh, pretty interesting, and I happen to be one of the reviewers of this manuscript and they still didn't take my suggestions, but preterm babies were almost seven times more at risk of developing adenocarcinoma, not squamous, of the lower esophagus than were term babies. Small for gestational age babies, so those under two kilos for girls and 2,100 grams for boys, were 11 and a half times more likely to develop esophageal adenoma CA, and preterm and SGA over seven times more likely. So the first paper looking really at the natural history in a retrospective way of untreated reflux and the real risk of esophageal cancer. And if you look at um, uh, this a paper published more recently, 2018, same sort of thing was found that there um, that if um, you intervene either medically or surgically in these more severe patients, you reduce the overall risk long term of adeno CA. Erosive esophagitis, which I showed you pictures before, the only national database, Mark Yoger, who's chairman of pediatrics at San Antonio, Peds GI, and I did this um, a, a study. It was a 20-center, multi-center study, and about 13% of children undergoing upper endoscopy. Barrett's esophagus, this was a six-year-old um, who had HIE, fed through a G-tube, came in because mom said coffee grounds were coming out of the G-tube, had never been scoped. Um, the the G-tube was surgically placed at another institution, and this child had long segment Barrett's, um, which is, puts him at, at much more at risk of long term. And really what got me interested in these esophageal atresia patients was this 16 year old who came in with dysphagia increasing over six months, had not seen a gastroenterologist for 10 years, was not on any medications, was a singer in the, in a, uh, um, was a, in the high school uh, choir, played actually beautiful voice. And her concern was she was getting some changes in terms of her voice character and tone and having a difficult time swallowing. And she had um, adenocarcinoma of her lower esophagus, 16. Um, she was a wide gap esophageal atresia that now they have much better techniques that a surgeon slapped a piece of colon connecting the proximal down to the distal stump, which even sets you up even for higher risk of adeno CA. And then um, uh, reflux associated strictures. So the figure on the left, a 13 year old traveling baseball player, good athlete, um, who in retrospect, the parents said, yeah, he, uh, he drinks a lot with meals and, uh, and he came in with a corn dog impaction. The stick was gone, but the corn dog was still there. Um, and, and when you asked his teammates, because three of them came with him, oh yeah, if he eats too fast when we're playing games, they were in a tournament in South Georgia, it was about 110 degrees and humid. Um, he would go behind the dugout, he'd throw up and he'd go back out and play again. So that was not an esophageal wimp. 
he was pretty stoic. And that little speck at the bottom is how wide open I could get his esophagus because he had a nice scar to his longstanding reflux. And then EOE, you can see the, the figure on the right uh, with rings um, can cause a dysmotility and impaction. Um, and then you can see that actually over time, there's an inflammatory response. And this is one of the, the data that shows that PPIs are not just acid blockers and they change the inflammatory profile. Um, and that if you intervene with either medical therapy or with surgical therapy, it takes up to five years for the esophageal mucosa to resolve. So we still don't know who's at risk for fibrosis, either in reflux or EOE. And then there was a meeting just held this past year, right before our NASP again annual meeting in November, that um, had this international esophageal atresia, that's the upper, the blue bar. So around the world, and the first meeting was held in Lyon, France in 2009, um, because parents were, and patients were coming down with esophageal cancer in their late teens and early 20s who had esophageal atresia. And then again, this is a multidisciplinary, so it's parents, patients, surgeons, ENT, pulmonary, GI that all meet and focus on reasons how to protect and prevent the long-term sequela. So esophageal atresia, long-term morbidities in adolescents, um, dysphagia, very common in these patient populations. And again, the International um, Esophageal Atresia Network, um, it's, it's www.we-r-eat. And it's actually neat if you go onto the website and it's contributions from, you can have state-of-the-art literature to parent and patient stories. So treatment options, and again, for sake of time, I'm not gonna go through this, but if you can get rid of the trigger or triggers, you can cause the disease to resolve. But for a lot of kids, this ain't easy. We were in the, uh, participated in the dairy elimination alone trial. We participated in the four food elimination trial. But when I presented it to the team for the six food and eight food elimination trials, they looked at me like, uh, no way. Um, uh, and it's very, very difficult for these patients. And you can think of all the feeding related behavior issues that these patients start running into. Medications and then newer now, um, the biologics, which are focusing on the inflammatory pathway, very much like Remicade, anti-TNF blockers revolutionized how we take care of IBD. This may revolutionize, at least in some patients, I wouldn't use it first line. And that's my personal opinion. Um, and you have to decide who's best um, uh, going to do that. And then a lovely review um, just published uh, this year in Annals of Allergy and Asthma Immunology that talks about the different biologics that are coming out and the pathway. The, the first actually drug approved for EOE, which is sort of strange, is a biologic. It's an anti-IL-4 um, inhibitor, and it's been approved for children over 12 um, years of age. But they're looking at everything from IL-5, IL-13, um, anti-cyclic 8, um, so stay tuned. So I think a multidisciplinary approach to managing this condition involving the family, psychology, allergy, GI, um, pathology, your pathologists have to be on board. And to summarize and then open it up for questions, what I hope in this sort of whirlwind tour of EOE and GERD, I've shown you that esophageal inflammation is a key step in both entities where there's problems. And the primary defect in epithelial cell function rather than the eosinophil defect in EOE. The EOs get recruited in because of a defect in the epithelial cell, and it's an impairment of epithelial cell differentiation and barrier function. Pathologic reflux is due to a dysmotility, transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation, esophageal body peristalsis inhibition, which cause inflammation due to refluxate of stomach contents that are sometimes associated with eosinophils. And it's got a chemical and a chemokine mediated component. Both EOE and GERD cause fibrosis and inflammation, but we still can't predict who's most at risk. Long-term reflux-associated inflammation at risk for Barrett's and esophageal cancer. PPIs can heal the esophageal inflammation in both en entities, but really deciding who's going to be the one to pick, um, it's still not clear. Children with esophageal atresia are at risk for both severe GERD and EOE, and there's subtle differences in the inflammatory response in the esophageal mucosa, a recent paper that looked at IgG4 in GERD 
compared to EOE. So back to the three things at the beginning. Good educators, you go back to the beginning and where you started. Reflux of food from the stomach with increased antigenic exposure, possibly, but in all cases. Reflux induced dilation of intercellular spaces, facilitating dendritic cell and antigen movement, likely, but again, in a proportion of cases. A common inflammatory pathway activated by both GERD and EOE, also likely, but in a portion of cases. And are they really part of a spectrum of esophageal inflammation like IBDs, um, uh, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's with environmental exposures, the right genetics and host immune response dictating the final pathway? Thank you so much for your kind attention and I will open it up for questions. Thank you very much. Two questions in the Q&A, but uh, I'll send it up. Right. <laughs> uh, I think it's interesting, we, we brought up in the last slide, that when we think of GI disorders, there's this common pathogen scale of uh, genetic predisposition, immune dysregulation, and then some sort of dysbiosis, a microbiome, issue and like you show in your data in Atlanta, we're seeing the same thing here, like an that exponential increase right. patients with EOE, with IBD, with all these immune dysfunction, dysregulation uh, conditions. And just wondering kind of your thoughts and hypothesis, whether I mean I've always talked about the hygiene hypothesis and how our immune systems are being developed differently, or is it is it like the bio? I mean, what your thoughts are that kind of underlays this increased incidence across the board? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the bottom short answer is there are probably multi factors that are contributing to it. I do think that um, sort of how you're born, um, even pregnancy, um, I, I'll actually today it, um, when I talk about H. pylori, um, we used to think that the major factors that influence the original sort of foundation species that you have in your GI tract, um, major difference was between kids that are born by C-section versus vaginal delivery. In fact, there's two NIH clinical trials now looking at actually vaginal flora transplant and babies born by C-section to see if in at-risk populations to see if you can change the dysbiosis. But we now actually know that those foundation species actually start being laid down in utero between 16 to 20 weeks gestation. And some of those microbes actually have immune potential in terms of the regulating the immune system. So I think it's it's got to be diet, environmental exposures. I mean, that's sort of the thing that we wrestled with my entire career with H. pylori. Um, it, the infection worldwide has continued to drop gradually. And clearly you can show with industrialization, better water hygiene, better food hygiene, you and no more fecal contamination, you can actually decrease the incidence of the infection. But it's more than just that. And, and so I think that we, there, there's, Again, multiple factors, and I think what you're going to end up having to do is, and it's not going to be um, solved by an individual one center. That you're going to have to have collaboration. You know, looking at um, exposures in utero. I mean, there's data that suggests if you give probiotics to um, a mom who has allergies, um, and the infant is therefore considered at risk in the last trimester of pregnancy, um, by gold standard egg challenge, milk challenge at a year of age, you can decrease the incidence of allergy in that particular child. So that's showing that you're intervening even while the child is in utero to change outcomes. So I, I think you hit it on the head. There are multiple factors and I don't, and I, and, and it's something that, you know, is adding up to cause the eventual increase in these immune mediated diseases. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts uh, on that chunky healthy baby who comes in with maybe questionable reflux symptoms, special fruit and bird, birth bird, and families that are on three PPIs have changed every two weeks, no response. What is, how is how do you push that? 
And how do you talk to the family about monster food? So when I have a pediatric resident in the in the room, I, I start explaining about why this shouldn't even be coming to the gastroenterologist in the first place. Um, that, but 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 I also, with, with no disrespect to my general pediatrics colleagues, it's it's time, and it's sitting down and almost debriefing, undoing, unwrapping all that they've sort of uh, gotten from their mommy daddy blogs to the internet to whatever in terms of of fixing that child, and then talk about what's normal, what's not, focus on the positives, that the growth curves look good, and that other than some irritability or fussiness, um, and then try to dig a little bit deeper if there's an allergy history, um, maybe, because usually it's not just three courses of PPI, they've all been on like 12 different formulas too. And when you ask them, and there's actually two great papers that look at this, they've never been on the formula longer than 24 hours, and they're still spinning up. So we had to change the formula again. Um, and when they've been on the PPI, they've never been longer than 48 hours, and they never saw the, the and what I try to explain is that if you're going to put them on acid suppression, it's really getting at the discomfort and pain related symptoms. It's not going to do anything to the regurgitation. So a lot of anticipatory guidance, a lot of counseling, a lot of focusing on what's good and, you know, getting them to buy into that. So a lot more talking rather than, and then, and I talk about the fact that even for infants with allergies, there's no good, I mean, if you send them to an allergist, they'll probably skin prick test them, but that doesn't necessarily mean those results are valid. Um, a, it may not even be IgE-mediated allergy, and B, allergy testing under a year of age is notoriously inaccurate. So sort of debriefing them on terms of thinking about rushing in and doing a lot of diagnostic tests, and if there's a diagnostic test this is what it should be used for. And then focus on good anticipatory guidance, you know, getting them, because usually those babies don't sleep well at night either because they're shoving something in its mouth every three hours because that's the only way they're going to get them to stop crying. Um, so they're waking up at three in the morning and, you know, giving them an eight ounce bottle. That's also getting a good dietary history. It's like, because overfeeding oftentimes is one of the primary drivers of I mean, you know, the stomach has a certain capacity and when it gets filled, well, it can't go out. It's got to go up the other way. So it comes out. So really more talking to them. And then when I'm teaching to, to teach my residents that you, you really have to talk to these parents about good, normal development. And, and it's a spectrum too. the kid that's not growing that's screaming all the time, um, that you it's just looking at because they've got atopic dermatitis and you know scaly skin, no hair because their their scalp looks horrible. I mean those those not you, Brad. Um, those those um. <laughs> sorry, I couldn't resist. Anyway, as somebody who's losing it up the top, um, but but you know th those babies, you know that there's something else that's going on. So really, it's it it takes time. I mean, I, you know, when I have those kids in, in, in a, in the middle of a busy clinic, I know that's going to come with the, I'm, I'm behind after I leave that, that room because it's, you know, they're usually on the ceiling. They've got, you know, toothpicks holding their eyes open because they're, they're nobody sleeping at night. They're also sleep deprived and irritable too. It's just as irritable as the baby. Um, usually I grab one of our MAs to take the child from the room and go around, walk around. And then, you know, it's usually Murphy's Law. The baby's like, oh, cooey. Anyway. Uh, Donna? Uh, so I think that is a Please. If it's red, it must be reflux. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Is 
Great question, and I'm not sure I have a good, straightforward answer. And but you missed the very, very beginning when I was talking about the dysphagia and feeding-related issues. The enigma that I think for all of us in neurodigestive um, who focus on these is that normal, healthy, otherwise baby who's aspirating thins, thick, you know, medium thickness, and then and then thicks, and and understanding why neurologically completely intact, developmentally completely normal. So that patient aside, one, I would say that, um, you know, one of the things I've, and we're still working on it, is standardizing your testing approach and how you address these kids. Um, the OPMS results, the oral pharyngeal modified swallow can change based on the radiologist, based on the length of time that you have the test, based on the experience of the speech language pathologist, even based on the time of the day. And there's actually some data that supports that. So making it uniform when you do that test, actually with some of these babies doing it to the point of fatigue, because mechanisms sometimes don't start breaking down until they get tired. Um, and then so that you know what kind of reproducible results you're going to get. Second, I agree with you completely that the airway, can you can think of it somewhat like the esophagus. But remember, these kids can primarily aspirate what's up here doesn't necessarily have to come up from the stomach and, and distinguish it between gastric microflora and oral flora that's being aspirated um, are, are, can be difficult. So the key is, are you, do you have methodologies that you look at for looking at inflammation, both in the airways and in the esophagus? Because nine times out of 10, when we scope, we don't find anything. It's usually up in here and they're still blaming reflux. Um, and there's non-acid, particularly in the infants under a year of age, there could be non-acid reflux. There's a very small percentage of these kids where there clearly is vocal cord, arytenoids, and inflammation in the oral pharynx due to severe reflux. But that's a very small percentage. And those kids aren't going to respond to a PPI in the traditional sense of six weeks and then done. Those kids need much longer because if you look at both human and animal data, you need much smaller amount of acid exposure in the airway epithelia than you do in the esophagus to cause injury. Um, so it's again, it's combining a standardized approach from the diagnostic standpoint, the ENT making sure that they look for a laryngeal cleft. Um, so doing a direct laryngeal bronchoscopy and then looking for a cleft um, to make sure that there isn't structurally something that's causing stuff, irrespective of how it gets there, um, whether it's coming in from secretions and saliva and oral microflora, or if it's coming from the stomach, and then, and then um, moving forward on, on terms of therapy. Um, I don't have a good, you know, it's, if you have a standardized approach and, and then a, a sort of algorithm that you use, and then from the management side, um, so thickening the feeds, working with speech therapy, making sure that those mechanisms are intact. And, you know, typically don't use a PPI unless you actually are seeing esophageal inflammation. Good question. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. So uh, we'll take it offline if we can certainly look if there's some questions on the, the chat. But thank you guys for coming this morning and uh, thank you for joining.